Hello, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing, this time on Project Calico. Um, and we're really pleased to have Andy Randall, the CEO of Tigera, here to give us a presentation and update and overview of Calico. And I'm not going to talk a lot on this one because I really want to hear more about it. And I'm going to let Andy introduce it. The way this session works is we have a chat channel in the background. And if you have questions, please pop them in there. There are a few other people from Project Calico on the line listening in and they can answer during that. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll open it up for Q&A. So with that said, I'm going to let Andy take it away. Great. Thanks, Diane. Um, and uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for your interest in Project Calico. And just by way of explanation, so I'm the CEO at Tigera. And Tigera is the company behind um, Project Calico. We work with uh, a lot of companies across the ecosystem, integrating Calico into various environments and um, you know, supporting deployments as well. So um, with that, um, uh, I'm talking about simplifying and securing your OpenShift network. And I know, you know OpenShift is a widely deployed platform. Networking seems to work, right? And so the very first question that you may have, you know, and and it's not unreasonable is, isn't virtual networking a solved problem? Isn't this something we've done before? We've been doing for years. Virtual machines have been networked for years. Containers are, you know, look just like a mini virtual machine. Um, that's done. Can't we just like focus on developing and deploying our apps? And um, you know, I think uh, that's a reasonable question, as Mr. Bean would um, probably be happy to uh, put it with that kind of expression. I did think. As you can hear, I'm originally from uh, from England, so I thought you might like the Mr. Bean uh, quotes there. Um, well, so I think that might that might all have been true if it weren't for the fact that we we're going into a new era of uh, of cloud native, and uh, the way we're architecting applications today is changing very much. And the first challenge really is all about scale and churn and the dynamicity of uh, cloud native architectures and you know the, the the first point to make is if you look at how um, you pack containers onto a, a given server versus virtual machines you know you're, you've got at least an order of magnitude more because you haven't got all of that uh, per workload OS overhead um, so you have one significant order of magnitude um, impact in terms of the number of workloads but more importantly uh, and this is something that we see in surveys and also just kind of the nature of how these applications are being um, deployed and a, dy a dynamic orchestrator. The whole point of that is you can bring up a container, take it down um, very rapidly. And so you've got, if you put these together, you get in terms of the, the churn on the network, how fast are uh, individual endpoints coming and going, uh, application workloads, containers, pods, um, it's probably at least a couple of orders of magnitude. And uh, if you think about the architectures that you build for one scale, if you increase that a couple of orders of magnitude, it's very hard for that to take that same architecture and have it keep up. So the kind of first, what I call first generation of SDN that was built around virtual machines that was based on a, you know, a single centralized controller that was the brain of the network and wasn't really expecting a whole lot of events to happen all at once. Um, they, we're tending to see them start to um, you know, reach their capacity when you really put them into production environments in a, um, you know, in, in a cloud native kind of architecture. The other thing that's happening, I'll talk more about this as well, is uh, you know, if you try and use a traditional vir um, virtual firewall to uh, route traffic through to enforce east-west rules. Um, again, the, the the amount of traffic and the amount of different connections within a within a cluster when you start to build a cloud-native application uh, tends to mean that you're not going to want to take that approach. And there are uh, there are other aspects of security I want to dive into a little bit more here as well. Um, you know, and the the first is that if you think about how we've traditionally done security, I, I talk to a lot of customers and they'll say things like, yeah, I have this subnet, which is where you know, I, I assign all of this, these kind of services into this subnet. And then I have a rule, which I program into the firewall, which says who can talk to that subnet. 
Now, if you're in a much more dynamic environment, as you will, uh, as you will be in with OpenShift or any kind of cloud native um, architecture, you're getting dynamic IPs assigned to workloads potentially from anywhere in a very large range. And you, you want that because the whole point of the efficiency of this kind of cloud architecture is you shouldn't be treating anything as special sn snowflakes. You know, the servers aren't special snowflakes. You just um, uh, treat them all as fungible resources so a container can appear anywhere with any IP address. So that does mean that your subnet rules and um, potentially your VLAN rules as well, the way you've um, used VLANs in the past, uh, no longer have, have meaning when you start to think of this much more um, fluid environment. The next thing that's, that's happening as well is, um, you, you know, the, the introduction of microservices mean, means that you're breaking down applications into many, many smaller components. And they, those components communicate uh, typically over REST APIs, i.e. network interfaces. So the exposure of your application to the network is that much greater. You know, attackers are already jumping behind firewalls getting from one layer of services to, to the next. If you're now creating you know, potentially thousands of potential uh, attack points across your application, that's a real security risk. So um, you can't just rely on a, uh, a perimeter firewall to protect yourself. Um, you need to think about how is that intra-cluster uh, communication going to be protected. Uh, and those, those might seem a little bit of a kind of negative points, but I also want to make a very positive point here as well, right, which is that, um, you know, there's an orchestrator involved here. Um, you have in, you know, the case of uh, Kubernetes, which, you know, Open, OpenShift is, is built on, right, there's, there's an orchestrator which is making scheduling decisions about where workloads are placed. And it knows things about those workloads, and there are there are schemas and there are ways for developers to attach metadata onto them. So with labels, for example. Um, so we know a lot more than we used to at a meta level about what is going on within the cluster. So, you know, I see this as an opportunity. This is a, this is a kind of a, a good news, bad news story. Um, sure, there are some risks and some things you have to give up from the old world of how you implement security, but there's also this huge opportunity to automate things because you've got, you're operating in an automated environment. And that whole problem that you used to have of uh, IP rules um, hanging about in a firewall and, and no one knew why they were still there, what we call cruft, things, things that are hanging around for years, can go away because you know dynamically um, where every workload is and that can therefore flow through into automated security rules. So. So that's kind of the, the background. So you think about those challenges um, and, the, and this opportunity. What, what, is it, what is it that we need to do to, to solve this problem? Um, and at the very high level, I'm going to, you know, I like to keep, keep things simple. It's firstly, I want to simplify the network, right? I want to take out unnecessary layers of complexity because that's what is, uh, causes challenges as we scale up those multiple orders of magnitude. Um, secondly, I want to secure the workloads. I want to take these fine-grained rules, say who can talk to whom, and integrate that with the orchestrator. That's the whole point of this automation piece. And then thirdly, I want to do these things kind of tightly knitted together in some kind of um, you know, architecture which is really tied to the way that we're building applications today and not bolted on in the side. So um, this is how, you know, this is how we think about things. Um, and that's essentially what we do with Calico and what I'm going to talk to you about over the next few minutes here, um, how we're addressing these challenges um, and, um, you know, what Project Calico does. And just kind of by way of background, uh, Calico is a project that's been going for a couple of years now. Um, it's open source, Apache licensed. It's a pretty active community now. Um, so we have about 100 contributors, you know, the, a lot of those from um, outside Tigera. So it's a, a very broad community of, of folks contributing um, into the project. And, you know, we're starting to see pretty large scales of, of deployments now. Um, some very large names, folks have talked about how they're, um, how they're de de deploying Calico in 
various different environments, um, a lot of Kubernetes, but also um, people working with OpenStack and Mesos and Docker and you know a lot, a lot of different environments. So it's um, it's pretty field tested now, and um, you know it's it's a it's a pretty solid basis for us to be um, building networks on and, and, and taking taking this technology forward. So step back and think about this simplification of the network. Um, and really, it's just kind of a checklist, right? So um, the first thing that we do, and this is very much in line with the Kubernetes philosophy. Um, you know, Kubernetes actually was the, the first of the orchestrators that really said, we're going to take a new approach to how we think about um, networking of these, of these pods. And uh, every pod will get an IP address. And the way I like to think about it is, you know, pods are endpoints too. Pods are just things that should be on the network. Um, and they have an IP address. We want to flatten the network, get rid of um, any intermediary uh, layers, and give them a real IP address. So what this means is, by default, we don't need an overlay network. We don't want an overlay network, in fact. Uh, and what that means is that uh, packets coming out of a pod just go onto the underlying network without any um, any enca encapsulation, without any additional overhead, and therefore you're going to get good performance. Um, the other piece, the, the the other approach that we have here is we believe in IP routing. We believe IP routing is the way to get to scale. Um, we try and remove layer two um, concepts, so it's a it's a routed model where a packet comes out of out of the pod, is routed onto the underlying infrastructure um, across to the other pod. And that's a, a very simple model to understand whether you're going to a, you know, a, remote, a remote node or a, not, a local pod, it's just a single uh, routed hop. Um, the next piece is, you know, the, there was a lot of work done around the first generation of virtualization, uh, network virtualization with virtual machines where people built uh, a whole virtual switches which did a lot of complex processing in order to emulate you know, layer two uh, connectivity across uh, a larger a larger scope than just the local machine. Um, we believe Linux is out there and uh, I think I think our friends at Red Hat would agree that uh, Linux is a pretty good basis for uh, building a product on. And it's got a very good, a very efficient uh, network stack, a lot of technology there that's very proven and solid. And uh, we want to leverage what's there. So you know, the upshoot of this is we want to get the maximum performance while making it really simple to troubleshoot. And we think the tools are there. Uh, and the way that we've um, put those together uh, makes, uh, makes Calico the highest performance, simplest to troubleshoot solution. So let's, let's look at into the, the next level of uh, detail in terms of architecture um, and, and think about, first of all, um, you know, as with most networking solutions, there's kind of two pieces to it, right? There's a control plane, and then there's how do your packets actually get around. So um, looking first at the control plane, we actually have kind of a hybrid here. So we use, um, we use etcd for, uh, for communication of a lot of the state. So we'll plug into uh, the orchestration system. Obviously, here in this case, uh, with OpenShift, it's, it's OpenShift, and that looks, uh, you know, a lot of the same mechanisms as Kubernetes. Um, and we use etcd as a distributed key value store um, using the RAP consensus protocol um, to distribute that state among all of the compute nodes. And, you know, one of the reasons why we chose etcd was because we knew Kubernetes was a, a key target. And um, you know, Kubernetes itself relies on etcd. So the, th the thinking was, if you know, if if that's scaling up for the underlying orchestrator, then our state distribution scales up in exactly the same way as the overall uh, cluster that we're uh, we're integrated with. So there's no kind of question as to whether you're going to get out of step in terms of the level of scale you can reach. Um, but we don't distribute all state via etcd. Uh, there's a, another way we uh, communicate between the nodes as well, and that's to communicate where IP addresses are located. And this is a kind of 
a special bit of state distribution, if you like, because this is a well-known problem that's been around for several decades. You know, how do I, if I have a set of nodes on a, on a network and I want to communicate to them how I can get to uh, ultimate uh, IP address endpoints. And so, you know, we, we don't believe in reinventing the wheel if there's something there to be, uh, to be used already. So we used uh, IP routing protocols to do that, and, and specifically the border gateway um, protocol, BGP, because uh, that is something that's proven to scale, uh, you know, at internet scale and is very robust and high performance and has a lot of the characteristics that we want. Now, um, you know, so, some people think because uh, there's sometimes a misunderstanding because we, be, because we use BGP, they think that means we have to talk BGP to the underlying network. And that's, that's not the case. Um, it's just a protocol we use internally. Um, having said that, if you are running on your own physical fabric and you, you, know, you have top of rack switches that can talk BGP, then optionally, you know, this isn't the default configuration, but you can change the, uh, the, the config to, to give it the address of a top of rack switch to peer with, and then um, the BGP can talk via that uh, intermediate top of rack switch. And you know, this, is, this is really nice, and this really is what, one of the reasons why BGP was such a great selection for this piece of the, um, of the architecture, because it means that from the compute node's perspective, whether or not I'm peering with the underlying physical fabric or I'm just uh, peering with the um, other compute nodes, uh, it looks exactly the same. So um, can we run an agent on, on each of these compute nodes? Um, and that is programming the routes into the Linux kernel based on what it's learning from other compute nodes via um, BGP. It's programming its own routes based on what it learns from um, etcd to its, its own pods, so it learns um, what its local uh, workloads are. And then once those routes are set up, we get out of the way. Um, the data plane uh, go, is from one pod. The virtual Ethernet um, uh, interface is hooked up into the Linux kernel, goes through the Linux kernel routing table, out over the physical interface, and is routed back on the other side. Um, no encapsulation required. The routing just works. Um, because that's what routing does. It's just IP. Um, and, you know, it, it's, uh, I think if you kind of think about how SDN has traditionally tried to sell you on, on the benefits and the virtualization and abstraction layers, um, you have to say, if this just works as your basic model, you know, why not just do that? Um, there is one other piece as well that we're going to talk a little bit more about um, today, and that is policy enforcement. Because if I just let all pods talk to all other pods, as in the previous picture, um, I potentially let in uh, malicious traffic. I let a pod talk to someone that it's not meant to. And uh, here again, the Linux kernel has all the tools that we need. It has very highly scalable enforcement of, uh, of access control lists. So that same agent, which is programming routes to the local pods, also programs the rules into the uh, kernel access control list, which is IP tables function. Um, and we have a very um, tuned way of doing this that manages to get a very, very high performance out of that. And, um, and so the traffic that goes out of the pod, actually the data plane isn't is that it goes through the, through the routes routing table, but also has to pass the IP tables checks. Um, this will also, for example, we can uh, we can program in here an anti-spoof rule so that a pod can only use the IP that has been allocated to it by the orchestrator. Um, the other point to make here, um, and this is, uh, you know, applies to kind of both control plane and the data plane, is I've shown both you know, physical fabric or public cloud uh, underneath. So obviously in the case you're just running on, say on bare metal, on a physical fabric, you have complete control over what the underlying network is. In many cases, you're gonna be deploying within virtual machines that can set uh, either in your own data center or in a public cloud 
um, such as Amazon or GCE or Azure, and um, you know, and then you don't have visibility or control over the underlying network. Um, Calico works just as well in that kind of environment as well. Slightly different recipes depending on whether you're in Google or Amazon, etc. But um, you know, it, it'll work across both of those uh, those environments. So I've kind of talked a little bit there about the architecture um, and, and how these pieces fit together. Hopefully that uh, that all makes sense. Um, but you know, if I come back to Mr. Bean with his grumpy questions, you know, uh, I've got a firewall at the edge of the data center. Why why on earth do I want network policies as well? What 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 does network policy do for me as a developer, as an operator? Um, you know. It, Exactly, how should I be thinking about what they're uh, what they're bringing for me? So, I want to kind of step back here a little bit and think about a cluster with you know n applications and n pods. And so, um, you know, by default, if you think about the connectivity matrix between all of these n pods, you've got an n squared a set of connect connections um, that are po that could possibly happen between any of them. And you know, the reality is that of that n squared set of connections, only a handful are actually ones that you, um, you're expecting. So you know that you're not expecting your backend database to have an inbound connection directly from your front end load balancer. But if you leave that the possibility open of allowing that connection, then you've created an opening for an attacker who gets in and, and compromises one of those uh, one of those application components to get to somewhere else. So the goal here is to identify that subset of the n squared connections and reduce connectivity to that and have the cal that calico agent on each node uh, program the ACLs to enforce just those um, uh, or uh, allow just those connections that should be allowed and deny everything else. And, and that, in essence, is, is what we do. And um, the way this is, this is done is via a, um, a, something that should be pretty familiar if you're used to Kubernetes, a, you know, a YAML resource file. Um, and it looks something like this. Uh, so you'll have, you know, obviously, the API version. It's, it's a policy file. Each policy can have it. Have a name. The, the key bits are where you get to this the spec piece where um, we can use an arbitrary selector expression. So in this case, for example, this policy says um, uh, says that it applies to everything where you've got uh, the label role equals database. And I'm going to uh, specify who I'm going to allow um, to make inbound connections into that uh, into those pods. So I'll allow TCP connections on port. 6379 um, from anything that has the label role equals front end. Um, and because I want to do keep this simple, I'll allow any egress um, uh, traffic out of out of this these database pods. But I could make that um, you know a much more complex egress rule. I could include um, you know more uh, more complex uh, expressions in terms of you know, sources and destinations, um, specifying IP addresses as well as uh, roles. I could be using namespace uh, selectors as well. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility and power within this um, network policy. Once you have it, then you just apply Calico Critical is our command line, apply this, uh, this policy file. Um, now, the uh, those of you who've seen any of these webinars where people have talked about Kubernetes network policy will recognize this because it looks very, very close. And um, you know, in, in fact, you know, the Kubernetes network policy was was based pretty closely on what we um, uh, what we built for for Calico. Um, although, what's actually in the Kubernetes API is a subset of this. If you want to just use the Kubernetes API, you can, and we have a plugin for that, and that'll um, connect into the Calico uh, policy enforcement or you want to um, get the full richness, you can use the, the Calico um, API as well. So that's um, that's kind of how you how you enforce that 
um, subset of connections within the um, you know, within the cluster. So I'm just going to come back again to um, to talk about how I take that file and actually and, and actually kind of revisit that architecture piece um, because I think this is a, an important distinction between how some SDN um, kind of first generation SDN products work um, and how Calico works because we thought a lot about how do you scale this up and how do you um, make this as efficient as possible, um, particularly when you have pods that, um, you know, and this is, a, I think, a key metric that, um, that we look at when we're doing stress testing and scale testing uh, is you want to be able to schedule a pod, have it come up and start and have network connectivity straight away. And if I, if I take, you know, many seconds to, uh, to get the policy for the pod, or if I'm doing that policy in a reactive way, so the first time I see a packet, I go up, have to go and ask some central controller, am I allowed to send this or not? Um, you're, get, you're gonna have delays on the network and delays scheduling pods. Um, so, so that's why we distribute this, uh, the actual compute function, all the, com all the compute intensive activity happens on each compute node. So the amount of compute scales with the number of nodes in the cluster, seems logical. Um, uh, and so what each, what each of those nodes does is it takes the, essentially that YAML format, um, you know, which is in, encoded in, and distributed via the XCD um, data store. And it take, it looks for all of the policies that apply to pods that it has and um, calculates what ACLs are required at that point in time for all the pods it has based on where everyone else is in. So for example, um, in, in the previous example, if the compute node on the left had a, um, you know, a database pod and the compute node on the right had the load balancer pod, then um, the compute node on the left is going to write a rule allowing ingress from the pod on the right to the pod on the left um, at, at a very simple level. Now, the other thing it needs to do, of course, is watch out for when things change because we're in a dynamic system. And that's where you know, the, the fact that etcd has this capability to subscribe to changes um, and to register for things that you're interested in now the left hand compute node nodes it's interested in when new front end load balancers come and go because th those are going to need new rules every time a new front end load balancer um, is created or destroyed and it'll update it, um, its AC local acl tables so um, so that's that's the the architectural approach and you know, at scale, we we test this, and um, you know that key metric that I said, you know, when you create a new pod, you've got to set up the network and apply policies to it. You know, that's typically sub 10 milliseconds. And when I say at scale, you know, I'm talking hundreds of thousands of um, pods within a compute node. So this is a um, you know pretty efficient, um, proven, and at scale uh, kind of system for implementing these policies. So I thought it'd be useful having talked through some of the, you know, some of the architecture just to, um, uh, just to kind of highlight, do a kind of compare and contrast. And, and this is really not to say, you know, one approach is better because there are pros and cons and it's really just looking at the, um, you know, the architecture really to, for folks who do understand say OpenShift SDN or other OVS based um, networking how how calico is is different so um you know one uh these aren't in particular order but one thing that um uh, quite a few of the networking solutions do and this partly inspired by google i think in fact when they first came out with um with kubernetes they said every node every host you'll get a slash 24 um that's 256 ip addresses a single sub a subnet and so a lot of the SDNs do this as their IP address management. Um, Calico has a much more dynamic IP address management. So um, we could, we'll take a smaller range of IP addresses initially, um, typically a slash 26. So you'll get 64 addresses. And then if you schedule the 65th uh, pod, we'll pull another address range. And we can do this because we have the, um, yeah, the routing protocol where we can uh, dynamically communicate around when uh, when addresses 
change, move or you know all allocate to new machines. So that means that we get a lot more efficient use of the IP address space. So you're not wasting addresses having 256 assigned to a host when you're only running 10 containers on it. Um, but at the same time, you're not imposing an upper limit on how many containers you can schedule. You can get, you know, put 2,000 on there if you want. Um, you'll just pull down more, uh, uh, more IP uh, pools. Um, so that's that's one architectural comparison. The the, the, the next one is, um, I, I guess, the use of bridges and, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, a, a lot of networking solutions. Starting from, I guess, Docker um, for containers, uh, put all of the local con containers or local pods onto um, onto a bridge. In OpenShift SDN case, it's the OBS bridge. Um, in Docker, it's a, a Docker bridge. Um, and the idea here be is essentially it looks like all of the local pods have a, a layer two connection. We take a slightly different philosophical approach and say. We do IP routing everywhere. So whether you, whether you are um, whether you're going from a pod on one one host to another host across the network, or you're going from you know between two pods on the same machine, it's a single routed hop. It's the same path, um, you know, and there's there's no bridge involved. So it's a it's a routed connection. Um, the uh, the next thing you know. I talked a bit about this earlier. Uh, no overlays. If you, um, when you connect with a traditional SDN to remote pods, you're typically doing that via a a tunnel interface at the at the bottom of the kernel. You'll set up a VXLAN tunnel between between two hosts. Um, you now Calico can do tunneling because sometimes it is required because you have a network topology underneath you where you can't route across it. Um, but it, it's not required. It's not kind of the the basic way of um, of getting packets out of a out of a host. So the pod has a real IP that's routable on the underlying network. So you know we just send it out of um, the F0 interface at the, at the bottom of the stack. The uh, one nice side effect of this, and um, you know, I didn't mention this earlier, but uh, you know when you're running on a public cloud. Environment, or sometimes if you're running on an existing OpenStack in, um, environment where you have, um, you know, maybe you're using Neutron networking, or you're using some other SDN, and in public cloud you don't know, you don't know what SDN is underneath you. It could be anything. Um, those underlying virtual machines are are going to be having some kind of encapsulation of the packets coming out of them. So if you if you um, if you use VXLAN or uh, you know some other encapsulation from the container down to the VM. Now you're going to get double encapsulation, and you know, that's that can be a performance problem, particularly when you start hitting the threshold of packet sizes. So the MTU limits on a, uh, a given cloud, you know, in some cases are quite low. Um, and when you're adding dozens of bytes on the front, you can start to get into Significant fragmentation, and that um, you know that can have significant performance impacts. So it's, it can be performance impacts can be really significant when you're talking about that kind of double encapsulation environment. Um, next point is how do you get outside of the cluster? Well, if if you are doing everything always in an overlay network, then you have to always go out via NAT. Um, now, Calico can can apply NAT rules because sometimes, for example, maybe you're using addresses. That are all purely internal to a cluster, and you want to be able to um, uh, to NAT to external addresses, um, but it's not required by default. Uh, you could have a set of external IP addresses that you assign to some pods, and then they just have a real external IP address, no NAT required. Um, the um, the next point, and this is maybe a little bit more OpenShift SDN specific, is you know, there's a couple of different met methods of network isolation, either the multi-tenant plugin or the Kubernetes network policy. Um, you know, we've talked about how we do network isolation. Uh, it's just ingress and egress policy rules in IP table rules in the Linux kernel. And that allows you to do multi-tenant. Uh, in fact, there was a great um, blog post by 
um, Giant Swarm recently about how they do multi-tenant Kubernetes uh, using Calico. And um, in fact, they use Kubernetes for managing multiple Kubernetes clusters on behalf of, of their clients. So um, I thought a re real kind of interesting Kubernetes inside Kubernetes use case. And they get that's how they get that um, uh, tenant separation. Um, but the last point is, is again, a little bit philosophical and uh, you know about where do you want your software and how much you're using all Linux, um, Linux kernel existing code. Um, you know, Open V switch, it's a you know it's an awesome piece of software, but it is it's a big BMOF, and uh, you know a lot of people say you know what I'd rather have I know that my data plane is running through Linux kernel um, it, it, and just the traditional layer three um, data path within the kernel and we're very happy with that and, and our code and as such is only uh, control um, control plane. Um, there's a couple of other points as well uh, when if you think about some uh, other SDN solutions and how uh, maybe some of the uh, more traditional uh, SDNs work um, you know one I mentioned earlier is, is this idea of a centralized controller and um, uh, you know, without mentioning names there are some famous SDNs that do this right they have a, a central controller node and maybe that can scale up but um, it's still a, a separate um, aspect of the network that you have to have to think about how that scales and that is doing all of the calculations for for the network um, whereas we distribute that um, uh, on, onto all nodes. Um, the next is more about kind of compatibility with other other devices, both cube proxy or in the case of load balancing, you know, something like OpenShift uh, router. And because we're using just standard mechanisms, you know, cube proxy will work out of out of the box very straightforwardly with uh, Calico, um, and same for OpenShift router because it's all just IP. So. Um, so th th those are some architectural considerations. Um, now, what we do hear from some people is they really like the way we do policy, but also for some reason they, and there are some good reasons in some cases, they want to use VXLAN overlay in particular. A lot of folks um, with Kubernetes use, uh, use Flannel. And Flannel is a project we're, um, we're involved with as, as well. Um, so it's been saying you probably can't do that. <laughs> Actually, we can, um, and this is a, a project that we launched last year um, together with CoreOS um, to to allow you to take, if you like, best of both worlds. To take the uh, the simplicity of a flannel overlay, which allows you just to allocate a sim single subnet and have VXLAN uh, to each host and have VXLAN tunneling between them, and take all of those policy rules that we talked about and apply them on top of that. Um, that tunnels network. So, um, you know, this this works pretty well. I've heard of um, quite a few people using this now, and um, you know, it's uh, uh, it's actually very straightforward. I mean, it's even though it's it's got its own um, kind of project repo under Project Calico. Uh, the the key piece is really just how do you get those two CNI plugins to um, to work together? And CNI has this um, has this nice attribute of being able to actually um, you know, uh, combine multiple uh, plugins in a in a single environment. So, um, so that's that's something to look at if if you're thinking that might be, um, uh, you know, oh, you have flannel, you want to keep it, but you want to you want to add policies to it. So, um, having talked a lot about Calico, kind of in a in a more general way, um, let's think about when we put this together, running with OpenShift, um, which obviously based on Kubernetes, and um, you know, to, to start with, I'll just kind of pop up um, a diagram which um, really just shows the the OpenShift uh, network layout, and where do the various pieces of Calico get installed? Well, first of all, on each node, we need to get, need to install. Um, our CNI driver, our IPAN driver, and the, those plug into the Kubernetes CNI interface. So they, that needs to be set up on each um, node. Then there's 
a single container that we have um, called Calico Node, which contains, uh, or a single pod, which is called Calico Node, which contains a, a couple of containers, one which we call Felix, um, which does all local routing, the policy calculation, another one, which is a, a project called Bird, which is what does a BGP control plane. And then we need a, um, a single instance of the of policy controller. And again, this is just stood up as a Kubernetes pod, um, plugs into the policy API and um, takes, that's if you're using Kubernetes network policy, uh, converts the Kubernetes network policy API into um, the Calico data store. So that's, um, that's uh, how the kind of architecture maps uh, in terms of how we've, um, where we're at with that, with that integration. Um, you know, if you, if you want to go out and try Calico with Kubernetes, there are tons of different ways to do it. Um, you know, some of the easiest are um, actually yesterday, um, Heptio and, Am and Amazon announced a quick start for Kubernetes on AWS. Which, uh, which includes Calico by default. So you just run that with its default settings and uh, there's a bunch of cloud formation templates which will get your AWS um, cloud instance set up with, with Kubernetes with Calico. Another really nice way of doing it, Stackpoint Cloud has a, um, has a point and click interface for creating virtual machines pre-configured with Kubernetes and, and Calico. You just click, yes, I want the Calico box. Um, and, uh, and that comes in. And then uh, the things like COPS and Kubadmin um, all come with um, the ability to configure Calico for networking as well. So that's all Kubernetes specific when it comes to OpenShift. And until recently, um, you know, the, we, we have had users doing deployments, but it's that kind of installation piece has been a bit roll your own and um, that hasn't been out there for the community to use. So we actually got together with the folks at Red Hat a couple of months ago and said, let's let's solve this problem. Let's um, work together and get uh, get the integration um, at a point where it's actually properly supported and we can certify it and all of that. Um, we did that on OCP 3.3 and um, uh, and it was working. And then OCP 3.4 came out at, and, and broke it. So we're working on fixing those uh, those issues, but that should be up soon. So um, I encourage you. To Watch this space. Um, you know, there's a, there's an OpenShift channel in the Project Calico org um, uh, um, Slack, and so please go there. Let us know you're interested. The more that we know, this is something people want to see. The you know, the easier it is to um, uh, you know to get uh, to get resources behind it. And and if you want to contribute and be part of that as well, um, you know, we're always open to that. It's a it's an open project, and um, you know, it's some I think some fairly straightforward things that we have to do to get this uh, to get this working. So, so that's that's um, that's my piece in, ter in terms of the actually you know prepared remarks. Um, here's how to get hold of us. Here's how to find out more about the project. So we're on GitHub at uh, Project Calico. You know if uh, if you like this, then tweet to Andrew Randall. If you didn't, my name's Christopher Lillian Stolpe. Um, you can tweet to Project Calico, um, and I'd say you know the most of the place where the community where the community meets is uh, Slack. Um, Projectcalico.org. Um, get into the Slack group. Um, so uh, that's it, and I'll open up to questions now. All right. Well, the, thank you for the overview, and um, uh, I like the watch the space, and I'm loving the Mr. Bean references here. Coming from Canada, we've got overload on uh, Mr. Bean. So um, Peter Larson's asking, what role does the namespace play with Calico? Are there any default policies that implement um, isolation between namespaces, et cetera? Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's a great question. So um, the namespaces, I think, are, are often misunderstood to, by people who think they give them a lot more protection than they, than they do. Uh, so you know, namespaces, by default, don't give you any um, isolation between um, you know, at the network level. Um, you can specify namespaces in a policy selector. So you can say this namespace can't talk to this other namespace. Um, unless one of the engineers who knows better than me who's, who's on the call wants to pipe up, I think um, right now there's no kind of automated way just to say all namespaces should be, should be isolated. I think you'd need to write policies for that. But um, I know, I think 
I, don't, I think Casey's on the call. I think you may, you may know. Casey's on the call. On, on the call, Casey Davenport. Um, I've just unmuted you. If you want to add anything to that, Casey, um, please please unmute yourself and, and join in the conversation. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. Can you guys hear me all right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Cool. cool. Yeah, I think that that's pretty accurate. Um, there's no default namespace isolation, but uh, the policy model makes it easy to configure that. Um, like I said in the comment, it also lets you do um, things that are more or less fine-grained than that. So if you wanted to say, give a group of namespaces to a tenant, you could um, configure policy that, that affects that entire group of namespaces as well. And the, the other question actually was a question that, that I had, because um, I was rifling through the documentation for Calico looking for documentation on the specifics around deploying um, OpenShift, a Calico on OpenShift. And you kind of covered that off in the previous, previous slide that it's a work in progress. But there is a little bit of documentation out there and um, some of the chatter on the call was that this is something that um, is coming in the, in the very short term. So um, I think Mark Curry is one of our product managers and he's on, on the call right now. I'm sure if he's listening in and I'll unmute him as well if he wants to add any two cents about that. Yeah, thank you, Diane. So we are very close to um, a good relationship with uh, Calico and agreement. And we are revamping our documentation for our SDN. And we would like very much to, to highlight Calico within that documentation. So I'm sure we will not only be sharing uh, links back and forth to specific to some of the questions in the chat, but also uh, we, we um, I, I, I think we will probably add something to our reference architectures to that effect as well. I think that's probably the, a wise way to go through. And Karthik is uh, on the call as well. I and mean, you can, if Karthik, if you want to add in anything, Karthik is an ex open shifter now working with Tigera. So we're, we're, we're thrilled to have um, him migrate over there. Um, but I, um, I, I'm thinking that we have another, you know, a little bit of work to do on our documentation. It's, one that's not as pretty as the other ones, um, but there's some more details that are missing there um, to make it work. So I think there's a little bit of work cut out for us still, but, um, and some of the customers or the folks that you showed on your slide earlier about who's deployed it um, at some of the larger places, I recognized a few of them as, as actually OpenShift Commons members um, and uh, reach out to them and see if we can then get them to do maybe a talk about how they, you know, if they did the role your own um, and get some of that feedback um, on Calico from them as well. So um, see if I can put the orange folks on, on the spot for that. Um, I'm pretty good at getting coercing people into talking, just as I've coerced um, Andy into coming to Berlin in a couple of weeks to drink beer with me and talk about um, Calico on a panel at the OpenShift Commons gathering on March 28th, which is the day before KubeCon. So if any of you are coming for KubeCon, please come a day earlier and join us um, at the open event. There'll be some amazing speakers, including Andy. Um, and you won't have to listen to me blather on because there's all sorts of great folks, um, not just in the on the panels and on the speakers, but in the audience as well. So I really highly encourage you to come. It's a pretty cool opportunity to, to meet um, some of the project leads on open source projects like Calico and Kubernetes and Docker and CoreOS will be in the audience and all kinds of good people. So um, if you're around, please join us um, and uh, we can get you there one way or the other in the room. And, and the beer will be good, I promise. Um, I see maybe one more question here. All right. Yes, uh, Jeff, there will always be a link to the presentation that um, Andy has just given. Um, we post it usually on Mondays after um, the following week. Uh, this week we have three briefings going on, so there'll be a lot um, being pushed out on Monday at blog.openshift.com. Um, and it'll also be on our YouTube channel. So um, we can find it there. And I think we will finally update <coughs> the Commons page and get it up there as well. Excuse me. Um, so I think that's it.
So Andy, I really want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule to do this. And I'm looking forward, Mark and everybody else, to getting the updated documentation there and link back and forth between Calipoot um, documentation and the OpenShift documentation and reference architectures. And we'll try and keep those links um, associated with the video of this. Um, so if you're watching this at a delayed point in time, check the comments in the YouTube channel and on the blog post, and I'll try and keep those updated as well. All right. Diane, I'd like just like to thank you for both uh, inviting us here, but also the great work you're doing on the community. I think one of the things that we've really enjoyed working with Red Hat on this and is just kind of how you know open everyone has been and how um, you know kind of inclusive. I think there's, there's there's a really good sense of community that you guys are building around OpenShift, and I think you know that's fantastic. Well, I will thank you for that and probably quote you on that. So. Um... <laughs> Take care and um, have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.